was sitting here uh, last week and I at the back <laughs> and uh, Kiran started the program off so I'm waiting for you. <laughs> She's the boss. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is a little earlier than our normal time so I'm really happy to see a house full and um, very delighted to have with us our first lady CEO. It's the first in the series of CEO series and to have uh, Nena uh, Lal Kidwai with us is just amazing. Our board member and uh, so a double honor for us. May I request all of you before I hand over the mic to Mr. Das to start the proceedings to please switch off your phones. It's just very, very helpful and uh, sort of gets no disturbance. So I wanted to give you all a second to please switch off your phones. And uh, Mr. Das, thank you so much for being here and for agreeing to do this. Uh, it's a special honor to have two trustees on the podium together. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran, thank you. Actually, I uh, don't have a choice because Naina's wish is my command. And uh, we were at an Aspen uh, India board meeting a few months ago. And I, uh, I'm also program committee chairman of uh, Aspen India. And I said, you know, Naina, you must be uh, on the platform and we must have a session with you. And she said, if you moderate, so that's how I'm here. I suggested more eminent people like editors of newspapers, uh, leading newspapers, etc. But she would have none of it. Um, and, and by the way, I'm sure I'm going to live to regret it because he's got a fat wad of notes here which he's not yeah. shared with me. So no. I have no idea what he's going to pop my way. I have <laughs> been reading up on her. Uh, <laughs> I've been reading up on Naina. And, uh, and there is so much to, to read. Um, and so much to know about her and I would, Naina said to me that she would like to discuss issues but uh, I thought we would first discuss her and then we'll come to issues because I think we want to know you and I think everybody wants to know you as a person and who very you boring. are and what you know. No, not boring, long. it's very interesting. <laughs> um, she showed leadership qualities at a very early age in school and I'm going to come back to that because I think that's a very important issue uh, to talk about especially in uh, today's context in the country in the world. Um, her list of awards are like a mile long so you know look at Wikipedia, Google, do something and you will find it all there. Her achievements in terms of Someone studying maths and science in school, uh, going on to then chartered accountancy, economics, of course, in between, uh, Harvard. I'm not going to say the usual thing about the first Indian woman at Harvard at the age of 23, but uh, Harvard. And then essentially banking and investment banking all her life. I think a life uh, full of, for me, a life full of achievement and therefore a, a star. We have a star with us, a very special person. And actually, we are lucky. Me to this was going to be short, Laguna. No, this is going to be very short. I've been <laughs> given five minutes. Uh, she's been traveling around the world as president of FIKI, I think the first woman president of a major chamber of commerce and a great honor by itself. And so we're kind of catching her between all her many travels, whether it's South Africa, Mauritius, England, Northern Ireland, just to mention the few places she's been to in the last few weeks. Um, I thought I would ask a very important question. Is anybody talking to you about writing a book about you? About me? Yes. Well, can we start that conversation? <laughs> well, there have been uh, books on women in India, and the that good news point. is that there are many. And uh, there are quite a few of these books now with a uh, chapter on uh, women. And uh, so, yes, I have contributed there. It's really hard work. 
No, because but a book, uh, somebody writing a book about you. No, no. Not I, yet. I think I would die. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a posthumous mm. event. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think that's something worth, worth looking uh -huh. at. Uh, worth looking at. Because you have so much uh, uh, quality in your experience, in your life already, that uh, I think this needs to be captured. So what is it? What is it as a leader? Because yeah. that's what you are. You're leading the Indian business community today as president of FIKI. Uh, you're leading HSBC. Going back to your school days, you were school captain. See, I've read up <laughs> all the stuff about you. So when you look at leadership, what is it that, what's important in leadership? It's a big question. And I think at the end of the day, one hones one leadership style as you move along. And in fact, I was very struck by uh, uh, something that Jack Welch said, how his own leadership style changed over time. So I would say it's very important to recognize that you have to have different leadership styles for different times. Uh, so for example, if you have a crisis, as uh, indeed we had uh, when uh, I was CEO of the bank, you know, just the banking entity at HSBC, we had uh, people trapped in the two hotels over the terrorist attack in Bombay. And at a time like this, you just have to take charge. Uh, so if you don't lead from the top, you don't manage to rally all the troops around you. And the truth is you don't have a laid down system. So you have to find your way. And there are decisions along the way which are quite scary because you're deciding should the person stay in, in the hotel or come out. You form the decision based on the best advice you can get. And you pick up the phone and you, and only you can do that because you pick up the phone, you speak to the head of the police, you speak to people you have access to in order to take the decision. So there are times like that where you are in charge and the decision has to be yours based on the advice of people around you, of course, but yours. And there are other times where it's much more of a team and uh, situations where you need to carry everyone along to the point where I typically go into a meeting uh, with my mind kind of in a direction of uh, where I think I want the meeting to end, because otherwise it's open-ended. But to be open enough to change course and at the end of the meeting to actually have taken a different decision to where you thought you were going to take it is also a test of how much you trust your team and truly work with your team. So at times it's about working with the team, at other times it's about taking charge, and at yet other times it's about letting others take charge because there are situations where somebody else can actually deliver better than you. Uh, and I would say, for example, on IT infrastructure. I'm not the last word on it. I can't let my IT infrastructure guy lead it either because he will take it in an IT direction. It needs to serve the business. So you allow your business head and your IT head to co-chair that. And of course, inevitably, they will come to fisticuffs. And that's when you jump in. But at least you allow them to try and agree what to agree on and what not to agree before you jump in. So I think leadership, the mistake we sometimes make is we define it as a style. You know, my style is you know, autocratic. My style is team play. But actually, I do think the best leaders are those that adapt and change depending on the way. And at any one time, you would have many tools of leadership which you draw on differently for different occasions and events. A long time ago, you went to school in Simla. Yeah. Very boarding long. school. Yeah. Not very long. <laughs> Was it your decision, parents' decision? You wanted to go, you didn't want to go? Oh, definitely parents' decision. You don't choose to leave home at the age of 11. Right. You're sent. So I was sent. And I think sent almost uh, kicking and screaming because I was very happy in the school I was mm. in. I was doing very well. And now I was in an environment uh, which uh, was quite different, uh, not just because it was small, and it was actually beautiful being in the mountains, so that was the plus. But suddenly, I was in a space where uh, Hindi as a subject was something that kids had been taught for the last 
seven, eight years, I came from, from Mumbai now, or Bombay as it was then, where we learnt Marathi first at the age of nine and Hindi at the age of ten. And I was a beginner in Hindi and I was one of those quite competitive sort of students and suddenly my grades were, you know, fine on all the other subjects, but here was something that was an integral part of the grade and I was, it was impossible to deliver on at a level that could keep me sort of, you know, topping the class. And that was a huge challenge and I, I remember feeling really frustrated because it's not like you can get tuition and things either, you're in a boarding school. So you have to learn to cope on your own. But I think it is those situations when I look back, which were actually the most, uh, uh, or the best learning experiences. Mm -hmm. Because when you come out of it, and you look back, and it begins to give you confidence in yourself. Uh, because there are things that you don't take for granted. And then you actually push yourself, and you finally achieve at a level you didn't think you were capable of achieving on. I was no star in Hindi, I can tell you, but at least I began to deliver at a level that didn't pull my grades back at the way the first six months did. So, so issues like that. And it comes back, I mean, at school, it comes back in very interesting ways because the nuns there had a very strong moral fiber. I mean, moral science was taught. And it was, in many ways, a very Christian education, not on Christianity, but in terms of qualities, principles, integrity, uh, which you imbibe without even noticing you're imbibing. It's an artificial environment. Now you look at it in an Indian context, it's very artificial. And it allows you also to develop links. I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, Belfast or Ireland just now, which I was just back from. And the mayor there has on his blog right now the fact that he met this business delegation led by me of someone who had been to an Irish Catholic. Uh, college, you know, you know to, to school, uh, understood Irish ways, and I can belt out a few Irish songs too, which, uh, yeah. So, funny sort of connects, and for him that was a really big thing in terms of connecting with the India business delegation that comes. So, these connections, things that open up, things that are different in hindsight, give you different milestones that you can uh, depend on. But, uh, at the time, it was uh, clearly not my choice. Yeah. But it was a very important decision, uh, I think, and the right one. Right one. Yeah. Did you uh, pick up your love for trekking and all that yeah. uh, in the mountains when you were in school yes. or, that, or uh, later? Uh, then, and my father had uh, been uh, quite, uh, uh, well, a mountaineer, not just a trekker. And was one of the teams that had gone out from when he was in the Dune School uh, to climb Trisul, which is one of the tougher uh, mountains uh, in the Himalayas. So uh, a little bit of that, I mean, the father influence clearly. Uh, but yes, uh, trekking, uh, I can't say I'm fit enough to do the trekking the way I did and seeing the wreckage in Uttarakhand, I wondered whether I could even offer my services. And I don't think I could make my way through the terrain as it's portrayed right now. I mean, it's just so tragic. But uh, yeah, trekking, uh, love of the mountains, uh, certainly from yeah. the time in school there. And Simla must have been very different then. Simla was a, uh, a much smaller town That's than similar. it is now. Uh, Himachal Pradesh didn't exist as a state. Yeah. It was quite backward. Uh, the, it was 13% female literacy, if I remember right, in the state when it got declared Himachal. Mm -hmm. uh, you do not see what you see today, which is very heartening. You know, young girls, uh, sometimes alone, uh, sometimes in groups, and they will walk uh, five, six kilometers to school uh, with ribbons in their hair, and it's, it's very heartening uh, to see where literacy has gone uh, for young uh, girls in Himachal. Uh, when I was there, of course, I wasn't noticing these things, mm -hmm. but when one began to, you know, you begin to understand why uh, it's important that it happens. Have you been back to the school? Uh, this, I went back. I did go back, back. Yeah. Uh, but the school is no longer a Loreto school. It's right. called, uh, they closed down the boarding school. It changed in character. But I'm in touch with some of the nuns, nuns. Uh, who taught me, yes. It was also a school, by the way, which uh, hosted Mother Teresa, because Mother Teresa was a Loreto nun. Right. And I remember she, uh, the time when she came back as Mother Teresa 
to visit the Loreto Order and to Simla because that was one of the schools where she had taught and uh, been quite touched by that experience as well. When did you start getting involved with the environment and wildlife and you've done so much in that area, you, yeah. you've been a great supporter. Supporter? I don't know about having done that much. Uh, it's, it's an interest area. Uh, it's where I holiday, wildlife reserves. I either holiday there or with my husband's uh, work in with Seva, which is really in the livelihood creation space. So for me, the holidays are short holidays in wildlife reserves, uh, typically around India, uh, a few times to Africa, but much more in India. And uh, I think anyone who goes out into our forests, uh, yeah. it can't not but touch you. So anyone who's had the opportunity will find it very, very difficult to uh, not be touched by it. So I had the opportunity to do it and continue to do it. And what I really love uh, about our forest is not the perennial hunt for the tiger, which sometimes can drive you mad because you have guides and drivers who think that's all that living is about. But it's about bird watching and uh, actually often just staying put for quite long periods of time, uh, and particularly for short-sighted the way I am, to try and begin to focus on uh, the bird life in uh, these areas. So it is really about the trees, the terrain, uh, and everything, the flora, the fauna uh, of our forests. And HSBC also, as a, as a bank, as an organization, yeah. does a great deal in this area. Yes, right? fortunately. And uh, I've actually been quite actively engaged with our uh, environment programs, and both in terms of uh, what we set up initially uh, which is uh, at HSBC with the partners we chose, and one of them is WWF, who's uh, represented here, uh, at a global level. And then the work that they do in country, so as indeed is uh, uh, what is done in India. But also to take the program to dimensions which are much more meaningful. So for example, we started the program as a program on climate change. And then you soon begin to realize that people's eyes, except those who really understand it, begin to glaze over. You know, what is this about melting glaciers? And maybe now Uttarakhand will make it a little more believable. But when you talk about it, the same issue in the language of water. So why water is important and how preservation, conservation of water is key. It's a very different dialogue. So you can have the same dialogue on environment and the issues around climate change, but do it in a more meaningful way, which enables uh, anyone working in the space to connect better with the communities you want to connect with. So uh, I started the water mission at FIKI uh, with the desire to get corporate India engaged on issues around water. And I was quite pleasantly surprised to find how quickly corporates onboarded the idea and it's all about water efficiency. And sectors like the power sector in India, 30% of power in the country because of lack of water. So in fact, the power companies were amongst the first to say, we are prepared to do a study on what are best practices in the power sector in terms of water efficiency. So essentially, taking that dialogue now in uh, FIKI, across each industry group, and everyone's at different levels, of uh, onboarding the idea of what water efficiency for that sector means. And my intention is over time, when we've got enough industries sort of socializing this idea to actually get to a rating process so we can then actually establish that. Uh, because as corporates become responsible for, and water efficiency can be effluent control, so that's in some ways the easier one because that gets monitored. But it's really, to my mind, about zero water, which is that the water you have, you continue to reuse in a way many countries do. I mean, I have actually sipped water, which has come from sewage, yeah. because it has been cleansed, and this is what happens abroad, that buildings are often just being able to rotate that water in a manner which is such that it is drinking water uh, coming out of what you would treat as wastewater. So it is about getting efficiency levels and, of course, looking at the costs, so making sure we can balance it so that it makes sense for industry, makes sense for communities, and uh, having it work. So 
I think my interest in environment really took me into the whole area of why are forests important because that's often where your water reserves are. Why is water important because it's important for society, it's important for our existence, and uh, how it needs to be respected. And India, in that sense, is disgraceful. We are a country that is not a desert. We are a country that has more water than we actually need because think of the rivers that flow through our country. We have water if we wanted to desalinate across three quarters of our country because of the coast. But uh, do, we, do we respect the water we have? How do we use it? The wasteful expenditure typically in agriculture. Uh, just the inefficiencies therein are very, very sad. So we don't have water. Uh, I mean, you ask any I mean, villages of Delhi uh, they, they have to go and demonstrate to get a bucket of water. It's uh, shameful. And this is the capital of India. So the whole story of water for us is a very big one as a country. Anyway, I can go on about this one and I'm taking you way off track. No, no, I yeah. wanted to, but I want to take yeah. you back. Uh, you come out of school yeah. and you decide to do economics. Yeah. Why? Oh, it was a natural, uh, 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 it was natural in that. Were you interested in the subject? Or I had, didn't have a clue what economics clue, was yeah. because I'd studied biology, chemistry and physics right. because, you know, I was in because a school. You, maths and you either chose arts or science. There was yeah. no such thing as economics those days. So I was a science student. And uh, so why economics? I think I had at least begun to think, and I would have been 16 years old, about the fact that uh, I wanted a career. So yes. And... Uh, my father was in the insurance sector. Mm -hmm. So what was a natural uh, movement into sectors which were OK? And there were no women in these sectors anyway. So everything was wide open. And uh, it made sense to be in the financial sector, because in the financial sector, your career could be in urban India. Uh, there was, for years and years, companies like Levers didn't take in women for years after I had joined banking because they found it impossible to marry marketing and being in the boondocks with being in the firm. Uh, so it was a little bit by process of elimination. So okay. it was quite a, 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 a decision that but, was yeah, it, well thought out even at the time. It, it feels like that. That's it why was. I wanted to ask you. And so I mm. took a jump into unknown territory <clears throat> but uh, with a mission in mind could have fallen by the wayside if I'd figured it wasn't interesting, but I enjoyed it. So. And then chartered accountancy. And that too was uh, therefore a step in that direction. So uh, I remember the discussion with my father and I was very lucky to have a guide like him. So you can do BCom in college, uh, but the better thing might be to do economics and chartered accountancy. So it came with that in mind. Uh, what was not on the agenda at the time was uh, that I wanted to go abroad to study. So that evolved. And that was a much bigger discussion, and not one that I was winning at every stage. It was a lot of money even then. He was a professional, and uh, it did take uh, uh, both my parents' time to digest the idea that I wanted to go off to the US. And uh, I won, I'm glad to say. And according to reports, your mother was more hesitant than your father. Yeah, inevitably. <laughs> Aunt mother's always more hesitant <laughs> than fathers, yeah, so yes. But normally when people went abroad to study and do an MBA, yeah. <clears throat> you usually have some work experience. Yes. And then you, you know, yeah. go on to that. But you went straight after doing chartered accountancy. Yeah. So in a way you work had experience. work experience because you were at That's how article. I argued it in my application. Oh, yeah. That's how you described it. Yeah. That you, you were working in Pricewaterhouse doing yeah. your working. chartered accountancy. So I was uh, the youngest person in my class mm -hmm. at business school. And then for the whole of my first year, I had regretted it, thinking, oh my god, everybody here comes with real work experience and all I've done is tick ledgers as an uh, mm -hmm. auditor. Uh, but the good news is there were people there, and you know, there were, I had friends who were 32 and 33 years old who were like, oh my god, I haven't studied for the last 10 years, so I don't know how to absorb anything. So soon my own uh, fears of coping, not having real world experience, and that too in the US, I'd never visited there, I'd never holidayed there, I didn't know, I mean, I didn't know a drugstore was something that didn't sell like a chemist, you know. I figured, I mean, how can you buy ice cream in a drugstore? So, so there was a lot of learnings uh, that came along the way about uh, the American way. Uh, why are 
post boxes blue. The aren't they supposed to be red? So it was uh, quite a learning as uh, just the living there and uh, adapting there was. But uh, clearly, the advantages of coming, you know, with your sort of learning uh, and being in a classroom format not so far gone was also an advantage. And I found actually it was quite easy to go uh, at the end of the day. You so enjoyed that two years? The two years were critical. <laughs> critical for me, I mean, I came from an all-girls school, all-girls college, right. chartered accountancy, yes, uh, but into a, f a totally different environment, into what was a global institution. With, for the first time, I was a pretty confident kid from about the age of 12, very confident in my abilities into an environment where I was no longer confident. Can I cope? Do I understand? Where am I? And uh, the stretch factor, again, is huge. And to me, those are the real defining moments. Uh, when you get out of your comfort zone and you're in spaces which, if you can succeed, it's a great confidence builder. If you fall, you have to know you have to pick yourself up and uh, start again. And uh, you just evolve. And then banking. And then banking, yeah. Banking investment and then banking. investment banking. It was first investment yeah. banking yeah. and, and banking. Uh, then on to banking, yeah. Yeah. Investment banking was a pretty obvious choice. 60% yeah. of Harvard Business School went on to join investment, investment banks. Yeah. So even if I didn't plan to, I would probably have wound up in one. Mm. So that, uh, at the time, the, the more critical decision was whether to return to India or to stay on in the States. And uh, I think I had pretty much made up my mind I would return. So, uh, and having come back, uh, I think there were times I regretted it. Mm. Uh, things moved very slowly. Things were quite painful in the investment banking world. But there were also very uh, interesting times. And I think for some of you who I know are in the audience who are probably at the same stage, you'll have lots of offers abroad and then you'll be in the decision of, so do I return? When do I return? I would say if you really want to make a difference, this is where you belong. Uh, the ability to have an impact here is far greater. So I was doing $100 million deals here, which were the first deals in the sector, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what I might have been doing there, which would have been a billion dollar deals. Yeah. But the fact that they were the first deals, you were defining the laws in some cases, uh, were pretty critical. Uh, the whole process of DMAT, I mean, I lived through an era where everything was physical shares in an organization where the vaults were so large that you couldn't even stock those shares. And imagine, just share certificates. And to move from that into DMAT, which is what India did, and to be part of that process, the setting up of the NSDL, the decision to set up a national stock exchange, uh, these are decisions where I describe it as, you know, it's easier, it's, it's very gratifying sometimes to be a bigger fish in a small pond than to be a minnow in the ocean because the impact you can have is that much greater. So, Zara? We have a young lady here who's one of the bright spots at Tufts University who has to come back and work with Aspen. <laughs> So I think at the end of the day, it is uh, really uh, the decisions we take. And you take wrong decisions along the way. Uh, you must take advice as you go, because you don't always have the answers. And then at some stage, you have to follow your heart, which hopefully is ruled by your head. But uh, you have to know where you're heading. When you look back, um, there's something which gives you the most satisfaction, something that has happened in your life, something you've yeah. done, something which is special for you? Yeah, I think, uh, you know... Apart from your daughter. Yeah, oh, well, uh, that has its challenges. <laughs> but uh, I would think uh, some of the work, which is what I would like to do a lot more in, in uh, the area of livelihood creation, which is where my husband's work for the last 10 years is very gratifying. I think to see what economic empowerment does to uh, very simple people, women, uh, is uh, very uh, critical, actually, for our country. Because, uh, and most of this work is with Seva, uh, which uh, is, as I'm sure many of you know, 
one of India's largest yeah. not-for-profits, and now has one and a half million women as its members. And organizations like this, in terms of what they have created, is pretty uh, enormous. Uh, that woman who, in it was like a village audience, and they speak Gujarati, I understand it a bit, but so I was speaking Hindi, they're speaking Gujarati, uh, stands up and uh, says with such pride that uh, my name is Rudy Ben. And so, so why, is, why was that important, uh, I asked her, and she says, because five years ago, I was known as the mother of my husband. I was a mother of my son, a wife of my husband. I didn't have an identity. Today, I earn for the family, which she was, actually, because her husband was not quite a uh, no-gooder, uh, basically drank and uh, sat at home. So she earned for the family. And that brought her the credibility that the fa not just within the family system, the social system gave her. And today, imagine how that woman will vote, because she'll vote with her head on her shoulders. Imagine how she will bring up her children. And when I last uh, interacted with her, they were working on a village project to uh, basically conserve water. And Gujarat is quite water scarce. So the water harvesting they were doing, uh, they were in a collective mode now, bringing pipes into their homes. And all of this happens through this leadership of a group of women who belong there and are now using their talent, their heads, their newly found empowerment to make a better lot for themselves in life. And uh, it's remarkable to see. So I think that would be an area which uh, I would certainly go back to work in. Before I share you with the audience, uh, I think my time is up to question you. What uh, what troubles you most today? Uh, corruption. Corruption. I think, uh, and within that, the fact that uh, India should be delivering to a much fuller potential than we have. The frustration of seeing what we are capable of and the fact that we just don't get there. So that, and the fact that you can work away at it, but the results are going to be very slow to uh, arrive at. Uh, so it doesn't mean one gives up, but uh, it's frustrating, very frustrating. Mm. OK, time for you all to come in. Uh, the mic will come to you. Yes, sir, over here. Uh, brief question so that we can cover a lot of, a lot of people, because I see many hands up. Yes, thank you, madam. Uh, I, we know that you belong to 1%. What would the Americans say, 1%, you know? I remember uh, when uh, attending that uh, evening seminar in New York, when uh, you with uh, Shabana Azmi and Indra Nui were discussing the rising women in India. And I said there also that we are talking about 5%. Do you think this figure will go up to 50 sometimes? Or this is the kind of rising that we know, need that since morning, I have been. I feel a little disturbed. I am not saying for anybody else that uh, the Supreme Court has reopened the dancing bars in Maharashtra. Is this the kind of rising that we are looking for, women? Well, this is a. It's a very big question. Uh, I'd like to slice it in different ways. Yeah, because so there's corporate India at a s sort of level where I have been. Uh, very much a part of, and I think there India has progressed beyond many so-called developed countries. Uh, certainly in the world of banking, I don't think any single country has as many heads of banks, and I should say, even 20 years ago, there were not as many heads of investment banks as, albeit in country, rather than at a global level, that as we had. And uh, so corporate India, and within that banking, investment banking, doing well, we can do better in terms of some of the manufacturing sector. I would then look at the next tier, which is you know, young people coming through tier two towns and joining the workforce. And that is also happening. I think the IT, BPO sector have been great uh, examples of pulling young people in to the workplace and giving them an environment which is by and large safe and fun 
And it's a lot of fun to work in. It's like a party every day if you ever go into these BPOs. There's a lot of uh, engagement of sort of HR type of things happening there. And uh, uh, they try and make the workplace happy because they're very young people. The issue really is what is the large mass of uh, rural India. And I would say at the edges also urban India, but those people who don't completely get embraced by our economic system. And there's a lot of work to do there. But even there, I take heart. I mean, I gave you examples of what Seva does, and you know, but what is one and a half million women in India? Uh, we need a lot more Sevas, basically. And therein, there are, whether it's the panchayat, and there's some excellent work uh, coming out of people like Abhijit at uh, the Poverty Action Lab, which is suggesting that women in the panchayat are actually beginning to change. You know, the old issue of fear was, and it's the reality, woman gets propped up by husband, by uncle, by father because of the reservation of seats. But studies are showing that it takes two cycles. Uh, so maybe up to eight to 10 years, if I remember what Abhijit was mentioning, for the woman to then begin to really be independent in her own right. And then she begins to exercise her position for herself. She's no longer a pushover. So we'll have to live that cycle, but that cycle is a big positive. So yes, is it happening fast enough? No. Do we have a long way to go? Absolutely. Is it happening? Yes. So I would rather build on the fact it's happening and give it a push than to criticize where we were, because we had a huge catch up, which we will achieve. Yes, sir. Madam, at the end of the conversation, you said corruption is troublesome. Being a head of the bank, very important bank, and you are holding position of president of Sikki also, and you are closely associated with the government organization. So the way black money is being stacked in different parts of the country, world, and they have, it is a, almost industry. They are surviving because of black money of India. Yeah. So have you ever applied how to take back and put it back in yeah. Indian development? It's a very, you know, the, our country has had a parallel black economy ever since I can remember, at least from the day I was born. And it's been there because we had tax rates of 97% and you know all of the issues that have existed. Now, how do we bring this back is the key. At what stage does a person who has stashed away money illegitimately, illegally, over 40, 50, 60 years, bring it back? How does he suddenly declare it? And the answers are not easy to find because for those of us who pay our taxes, you know, my reaction is, so why have I paid my taxes if somebody else gets away scot-free? And that becomes the problem. So the answer is not easy. And the fact that it's there is a given. And by the way, the only thing I take some comfort from is India is not alone, Greece, Italy, Spain. But you can see where Greece, Italy, Spain have gone as well. So we have to be able to, at least going forward, tax what is the true worth of our country. And in this one move is a very important tax called the GST. Why are we saying of industry platforms that GST is important? Why is this goods and service tax important for the country? Why are we saying it will add 2% straight to the GDP of the country? The reason is it will tax at source for industry. So if we can move to a regime such as GST, where there's a lot of work happening right now, and I believe we're 80% of the way there. So it needs a push because there's opposition from opposition parties, not because it's ideologically a problem, but because it's in opposition, that we can get something like this in. In this day and age, we can create the tax backbone, makes it transparent, tax at origin, and you solve the problem going forward. So it, the solutions are actually staring us in the face. The solutions are known. And it's back to, you know, so what's frustrating is that we can't get there. So there are many people in government working very hard to get there. There's an excellent head of the Standing Committee on GST Parliament in Sushil Kumar Modi, who in fact comes from Bihar as being the finance minister there. So, uh, and he is actually leading this uh, very, very effectively. But we haven't closed that uh, completely as a country. So 
I think we can make that quantum jump. Uh, we have shown it in, to some extent in the backbone we've developed on tax. There are countries that are coming and now visiting us and saying, well, we don't even have it in the, you know, in the UK in terms of whether it's passports or a tax system which uh, we have now got so many people on it. We need to now be able to mine that data better so we can pull more people into the tax net and make it more friendly to uh, the taxpayer. But IT, I think, and I've just come from a whole afternoon on issues around e-governance, which uh, would well be a solution. So the solutions are there. We just have to implement them. The next three uh, persons are all ladies. We'll start with the lady at the back. We'll come to you, and then we'll come to you. Um, thank you so much for such an open and inspiring uh, talk. Uh, my question is um, a bit personal. So if you could give yourself one piece of advice when you first took a senior management role, what would that be? It would be not to take myself so seriously. <laughs> yeah. okay. Anything else? I think that. And I feel that's very important because sometimes you, you, you work yourself so hard in trying to prove yourself that you forget to have fun along the way. And you can lose your sense of uh, balance in terms of uh, what is needed uh, at the end of the day at many levels. So I see, frankly, in someone like my daughter, a much better sense of balance than what I had at that age. And uh, I think it is, at the end of the day, about balancing all the various things in life that you want and making sure that you do it in a manner that gets you to your end goal, but do it in, without driving yourself uh, nuts in the process. Yeah. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, it has been a delight to hear uh, uh, things like socio-economic and ecological issues coming up from a person in banking and financial sector um, uh, that too, at such a senior level. So uh, definitely, um, there, uh, there's an increasing trend in CSR that we've been seeing. But ma'am, how do you think, at a personal level, such values can be imbibed in uh, senior management? Is it, is it by having more women CEOs? Because I've read somewhere that women have higher ethical standards. Or basically, how do we actually uh, you know, have yeah. such values uh, so that you know, there's a proper mix of, um, uh, say, corporate and social uh, in yeah. its true sense? Yeah. Well, I, I think the easy answer for me to take is it's now by government dictate. Because there's a new rule that has come in where uh, corporates over a certain size have to spend, and it's a guideline, it's not yet uh, an, in a, law. a law, but it could become a law if we don't do what we should. Uh, and that is that 2% of the spend uh, of our profits needs to be in CSR type activities, which are very widely defined fortunately, because uh, at the end of the day, we have to make sure it doesn't become a tax on the system, that our corporates don't become uncompetitive because they're forced to do things that corporates elsewhere in the world don't do it. So what we are doing uh, at FIKI is actually helping to evolve what uh, is a principle very close to my heart called creating shared value. And Michael Porter at Harvard Business School has actually been one of the proponents of this, which is that there are many models which work both for the community and for the corporate. So when you spend it, it's not pure CSR. You can defend it to your shareholders and your stakeholders as also benefiting the corporate. And to give you an example, uh, you take a company like Nestle, and it's worked for over now 40 years in the Moga district. And even through all the problems that Punjab had uh, when whole swaths of industry just ran away from Punjab, this factory continued to run every day, every minute. It didn't shut down for a minute. And the reason was that it had engaged so well with the communities around it for milk supply. It had helped small farmers become big farmers, uh, cattle farmers. Uh, they had started with small little sections of land which they were basically growing wheat in. And they became cattle farmers with 100 head of cattle the company providing them basically some support uh, 
through veterinary care and how to look after the cows and the principles of how to actually milk the cow, not forcing them to sell to Nestle. So many of these farmers sell about 50% of their product uh, to Nestle, the rest is wherever, offering their market price. But the engagement was such that the company benefited because it had a regular supply of milk and the community benefited to the point that they wouldn't allow the terrorists in to shut the plant because, I mean, of course, if the plant shut, then their livelihoods were going to go out. And that, to me, is a win-win solution. So the, by the same token, another company can work with the communities around them. After all, you draw your labor from the villages around. If they aren't healthy, and it's not just them, the families they live in, if everybody's sick around them all the time, they're going to be sick. So you can really defend taking health programs to the villages from which you draw your workforce by similarly suggesting that it creates shared value, because it does. So I think there are many models around the creating shared value principle, which is a win-win, a win for industry, a win for uh, other communities. And it is these sort of examples that we can populate uh, the imagination of corporates with, so that uh, we get to move to the next agenda. And actually, corporates can run these programs really well as well. So if we get not just the money, I think money there is. Government has a lot of money it throws at these programs. It's how it's spent that corporates can play a very important role in uh, just upping the way that the money earns dividends from the spend. Just to add uh, yeah. and to ask you a question from what you just said, I sometimes wonder where have all the managers gone? I don't mean the private sector. I mean in the government space. Um, it's all fine to have policies, yeah. but getting things done, the word you said, how, yeah. I think people in the private sector are trained and learn how to get things done. Uh, is that something missing in the country today? Well, clearly it is. But you know, I take heart also from the fact that the Mahakum, I call it pop-up city. I mean, how many countries in the world can build a pop-up city, it was all tents, in, where nothing existed, put sewage systems in, and I mean, I'm sure we all have people who went there. I mean, I had some very finicky foreign friends who went there and came back, you know, like, absolutely, it was clean, it was wonderful, it was safe. Uh, and we can't seem to manage our cities, but we can do a pop-up city, 100 million people passing through in the period of you know, six weeks and succeed. So somebody was in charge, and that person was a government officer. So I think it isn't about the quality of the person, it is about the way he's empowered. Single point of control, he knew he was in charge, able to draw on the administration around, and it happened. So there's something fundamentally wrong with the structure where we give people jobs for under a year and then expect them to deliver. Where, uh, so it isn't the person, it's the structure. structure. Yes, ma'am. You're as well. Yeah. Um, Nanaji, I would like to ask you a very pertinent question, probably which is the need of the art in the country today. As the head of uh, two institutions related to banking, uh, industry, and commerce. Uh, today evening, uh, from uh, hereafter, if you have a meeting with uh, Mr. Subarao, uh, the uh, Reserve Bank of India's governor, and uh, P. Chidambaram, our finance minister, what, what are the two most important uh, suggestions uh, <laughs> you would give them to improve, improve upon the falling uh, rupee? Yeah. And uh, when do India get a hard currency? When would Indian uh, rupee be a hard currency? Uh, kindly? Yeah. And at the moment, at 5 o'clock, there was a meeting at the PMO. They are discussing on the FDI caps. So I would like to know what your suggestions would be, your inputs. Yeah. I am sure they would be quite valuable. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, so I think uh, the easy one on the, when does the rupee become convertible, well, it has to be when the fiscal deficit comes under control and the fiscal deficit is unfortunately nowhere near under control because it will get linked to that uh, because we can't import all the world's problems on top of our own problems by making the rupee convertible and frankly, 
China is working towards making the renminbi convertible. Uh, they will show us the way, and they are certainly uh, in moving very, very quickly in that direction. So we will have a good model to follow uh, when we're ready, but it's not going to happen in a hurry. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Dr. Subarao and uh, our finance minister, uh, well, I've already met them. So uh, uh, the issue really is uh, there are many, many things, and they, they have all the answers. Uh, they know. But the biggest issue for us is long term. Whatever we are doing now, FDI caps, as you rightly pointed out, being uh, uh, enhanced, is short term. So in the short term, to sort our current account deficit, we need money, FII, FDI, in whatever form. But what we do need to resolve in the longer term is so why is our current account deficit so high, the twin deficits? It's high because of our energy bill. 80% of our import is made up of oil and gold. So they tackle gold. But how do you tackle oil? And the only way is we need to be able to produce more gas in this country. So some of the measures they're taking in terms of increasing the price realization of gas is the right one. You need to be able to price gas correctly, hence the fuel subsidy bill. Uh, we need more solar power. We need more wind power. We need every type of power we can get and coal policies, which work. I mean, we have the third highest deposits in the world, but we stopped mining coal for a while because of environmental issues. So we go from a go-go era to a no-go era. There's solutions in between, which is what we really need to work out. So energy security will be key to bring our import bill down, and on the other side, increasing exports. And unfortunately, all of that is going to take time. So the longer-term solutions, which need tackling, simultaneously with the near-term ones, like bringing FI, FDI in, are as critical, if not more critical, and those are the announcements we should be seeing more of. And the fiscal deficit, as you know, it's about more tax collection, but it's also about growth. Because if we don't grow, we have no money for redistribution. We cannot have a socialist model of spending money on lots and lots of poor people who need it, and spending that money really badly, as we do, without the revenue. And you don't get revenue without growth. So at long last, we had a very important statement from the finance minister at the budget. He opened his budget speech, as you might remember, saying that we need growth in order to have inclusion. And that is the agenda which has to come back. We kind of got into the inclusion mode and lost the, the track on growth. And balancing those two is never easy and particularly in an election year. So I think what we all have to do is to keep understanding what we need to temper down on one side in terms of the desire of government to spend on programs and spend really badly sometimes, vis-a-vis -vis the growth agenda which we are now down to. You know, projections of five and a half to six percent on GDP growth, and it can easily be 5% by the Planning Commission's own statement. If we don't do certain things, we could be at 5%. And at 5%, we are going to doom half of India to poverty for years to come. We really do need the 8.2%, the planning, if the, the plan, the latest plan has actually stated, 8.2% is what we would need, and here's what we can do to achieve it. So it's within the realm of achievability. So a long answer to your question. Yeah. That's what she'll do if she's finance minister. <laughs> Just one minute. Yes, Ambassador. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, can I ask you to add it slightly to the, um, the answer you gave? Second, but one question. I'm preparing a speech on sustainable energy investment and sustainable energy in India. And perhaps you could say a few words of what you see as the role of the banking sector in encouraging investment in, in environmental questions. So the banks actually did go into wind in quite a big way, but have suffered because uh, of some of the bad loans that have come, unfortunately, from the sector. And uh, solar is therefore one which is seeing very slow traction because the models are still new. And really, it is about banks being comfortable about the lending into projects which are unproven. And there are no fiscal incentives there uh, to protect the bank. 
So I think the answer in financing is going to have to lie in venture capital, in risk capital, because banks are accountable at the end of the day to uh, a whole bunch of other shareholders. They are not in the business of charity. Uh, they don't have the appetite for risk either, uh, certainly not in this environment. So the funding is going to have to happen of venture capital and some very interesting roles that organizations like IFC are providing on credit enhancement. So a bank will step in where an IFC has provided some types of guarantees which takes away some of the risks that banks perceive when they lend. So, uh, uh, and IFC is coming in in some very interesting projects. I mean, there's a cook stove project, in fact, with Seva, which IFC has stepped in to do some of the guaranteeing so that banks are lending so that the cook stoves can get financed for the women in uh, the Seva membership. And uh, so you can get you know, a nice mix therein. But I think credit enhancement is the role which a body which IIFCL was set up by government to do and has not fulfilled its task. But that was the intention. And uh, it could be used for sustainable uh, projects. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, I'm Amy Kasman from the Financial Times. Um, in the book, Leaning In, to which you um, wrote the foreword, I guess, for the Indian edition, um, Sheryl Sandberg, um, the COO of Facebook, argues that women in America, I mean, she's specifically looking at America, in the upper echelons of the corporate world, in white call, educated white collar professional women are holding themselves back. That they are in turn, you know, they have internal barriers which are preventing them from rising. I would like to ask you, in the Indian context, at corporate India, um, white color, educated professional women. Of course, we see outstanding examples like yourself and um, others. But do you think that? in this category of women, are women holding themselves back professionally or are other factors holding women back professionally? Or do you feel that actually women here have unfettered you know, ability to sort of rise up to the top? Uh, I think the, there are, I often like to call them uh, glass ceilings that we create for ourselves. So we don't think we can be considered for the next job because uh, we don't believe in ourselves. Uh, we don't push. And you know, my favorite story is uh, how typically a, my sort of direct recruits, uh, the guys will follow you all the way to the loo. They would have come into the loo with me if they could, pushing their cause. You know, they'll catch you wherever they are. The women who they come into the loo with you will not raise it. Okay? So women don't push hard enough. Uh, guys just do. And I think some of it has to do with a little bit of women's sort of self-belief. It also has a little bit to do with an attitude of, well, I'm good, and you should notice me for what I am, and I, why am I having to push? Uh, but what you get as a result of this is uh, an artificial barrier, which is self-created. So I've always encouraged women who work with me and otherwise to make sure you're out there uh, do what the guys do. OK, you don't play golf, but at catch people where you have to and push your cause. Don't hesitate to do that. I think the other one does come from uh, society. I mean, I don't think that has changed significantly. I mean, I think of at every stage, so my own mother was like, so now you have a kid. Don't you think you should be looking after your kid? Uh, and you're on a guilt trip. You're already guilty, and then you've got your mother making you guilty, and if, you know all the sort of aunts and uncles sort of make, making you feel like you're uh, a freak. So that too, it's changing in that husbands are stepping in more in terms of daycare and uh, helping with uh, the, the kids. But the older generation, and often my generation, would still uh, not condone uh, easily anyway the fact that you are away from your child and fulfilling your responsibilities to as a sick mother and you know all of those things. Uh, much more of a guilt trip for a woman in society today than it is for a guy. It's always been, it's getting better, but it's still there. And I think these are uh, some of the areas which will hold women back. Uh, I would like to believe it's less of a fight. Uh, you don't have, you know, you, you have more people with you to battle the battles, and there are battles. Uh, I think the younger generation is entering in with far less of a chip on their shoulder 
in this regard, so that's good. They can just be themselves, and I think that's a big advantage as well. Uh, I don't think all organizations have created enough of a level playing field and an enabling environment. It's easier in the service sector. Uh, most of Indian industry is still family-owned companies. They have still not embarked on a course which says that the, may the best kid win. It's the guy, even if the daughter is more uh, equipped and smarter. It's changing. It's changed first in those fathers who only had daughters, so they were stuck. But it's happening more by choice as well. Uh, but Indian family-owned businesses have a ways to go in terms of uh, inducting women into the serious, their, their daughters, not just women, into their sort of serious uh, uh, roles. So the barriers exist there, and I think the change will really be when we begin to see those Mehra and brothers being Mehra and sisters and Mehra and daughters, you know, as against uh, what is still a proprietary shop sort of father to son syndrome. Uh, so we've, we've got many areas which need attention, but I think there are outstanding examples like what India is today in the world of banking and investment banking and uh, leadership therein, as I started to say, uh, of lots and lots of leaders. And now we've got them in the public sector too, uh, in a big way, uh, State Bank of India. I mean, that's a big one coming up, uh, which is enormous uh, to see senior women uh, now in charge, which is, you know, I think a change which is there to stay. So. Yes, second row. Uh, Ma'am, I work in the real estate financing sector, and uh, even today we see that, you know, uh, we say roti, kapla, and makan. And today, even today, housing is a very critical need for any family. Uh, so although I do a lot of corporate financing, but we also try to do a lot of affordable housing projects. And where we find difficulty is that there's inherently such a big risk in financing such a project because you don't know who are the end consumers. And uh, I think this is a very complex issue, and we should discuss this offline. But I do have some thoughts. And it's also in a sector which is such a mess that uh, it needs uh, a very different, it's not just about government. The sector itself needs better governance. Uh, we need uh, to resolve that. I mean, quite honestly, uh, there are many, many projects, not just affordable housing, which will never see funding because they're happening from builders whose reputations are mud. There are certain types of projects and builders that get funding from banks because they've been able to deliver. And the rules now, and I think we needed this regulator for housing, are very important because the old tricks of builders of taking money from project A, putting it in project B before you finish project A is the problem. So I think the issues are well known. The whole class of real estate projects have to improve not just affordable housing. And within affordable housing, uh, maybe the issues can be addressed uh, better uh, if we can get the project itself sorted out, completed before it's uh, in there for the loans. There are still a number of people with their yeah. hands going up, but uh, Kiran says time is up. Yeah. And uh, so time is up. <laughs> but uh, we, maybe some we of We all them, know who's the boss. Yeah, some, <laughs> yeah. some, some of them are going to probably want to talk to you offline. Um, I'm going to ask a last question. We have uh, now several examples of people having done very well in the private sector, uh, moving eventually to public service. Um, as far as I know, I mean, you can think of Arun Myra or Nanda Nilekani or Ramadurai. Um, they've all been men. I can't think. I, I don't know whether there's been a woman. So are you I'm ready? <laughs> are you ready for public service eventually, not tomorrow morning? Would you, would you, if the country came to you and said, Naina, you know, we want you to take leadership of something obviously yeah. major and all, or are you completely committed to private sector and all that? Are you open to the thought? Then nobody's ever asked. So, yeah. I think the time but is a coming. A, a lot, a lot will depend on sure. uh, what on what, is. on what. But absolutely, I think. Uh, in every role I've worked in, I've spent uh, energy and time in things which are outside my day-to-day -day space. Uh, 
I've been engaged with Fiki setting up the Financial Inclusion Committee and leading that uh, at a time when microfinance wasn't even in fashion. So it came into fashion and out of fashion and the water mission and these sort of engagements uh, are things I do enjoy because I get quite bored working in the one space. So uh, for me, any of that would be valuable provided I can deliver uh, and the environment were one which enabled one to deliver. Sure. I think that the challenge is, is that. Sure, sure. It's not the position, it's what you can do. The environment is only going to be tough, yeah. <laughs> as always. So. Now let me conclude this uh, session by uh, just using a few words which uh, come to me as I have listened to this conversation and your responses. Um, capable, competent, <laughs> professional, mm. but most important for me, modest, mm. uh, balanced, and thoughtful. Mm. I think it's been great to have you here this evening. Thank so you. let's give her a very big hand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.